What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Cinema Royale, where we're two DC area film critics that just talk about whatever we want to around the film world, and you, we'll usually cover some reviews. Actually, we cover a lot of reviews, let's, not, let's be honest, but um, thank you for joining us. If you haven't seen the show before, that's what we're all about. If you have, we appreciate the support. Um, before we get started, I'll get all the crap out of the way uh, before I introduce Travis, or he introduces himself and all that. I guess I just kind of did, but... Um, don't forget, if you're watching us on YouTube, to uh, like and subscribe below. Uh, it really helps us out a lot, and I promise we won't blow up all your feeds. Uh, if you listen to us on podcast, um, anywhere podcasts are available, and you have a few seconds extra, um, do us a favor and write a review. It helps out more than you guys know. So, uh, And everybody that's already done that, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, and without further ado, Travis Hobson, everyone. Mm-hmm. Our friend Tim Gordon about it. he thought there were like two episodes of it. I was like, nah, man, it's like it's one. <laughs> the penultimate, as it's they say when you're talking fast. classy. It's amazing how fast it's gone. It is. Um, we're talking about the new Spider Man movies title, which is out, and I think the title says a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot surrounding uh, this third Spider-Man movie we're going to get into, and some, and some of it connects to Wandavision, so that we talk about all that. Um, and all then the roads lead to Wanda. All roads lead to Wanda, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the and then the um, uh, the big news of the week, which is uh, a new Superman movie that is in the works. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a Black Superman, which I think is very very interesting. So uh, so we're going to talk about all that stuff. But we also got reviews this week of Tom and Jerry, which. Uh, John loved. I'm just going to spoil that for you right now. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Cherry with Tom Holland's the first movie by the Russo brothers uh, since their since their Marvel days. The first movie they directed. Mm -hmm. um, and we're doing another one, which I don't remember what it was. Oh yeah, United States of Billy Holiday. Yeah, first if, if you guys want to get full in depth reviews, uh, remember to check out PunchDrunkCritics.com. Uh, it's a website. We post all the news and notes and everything like that throughout the week. And then everything that comes out, you can find a review for there. Um, on this show, we're, we might says, talk about things for a while. We might not. We'll go in the section that says reviews, and you'll see all the reviews there. Um, everything that we did during the week. We do a lot more than what we talk about here on the show. We're just kind of kind of shoot the shit on the show. Uh, yeah. So um, so let's let's start, let's start with the first movie because I'm excited to hear your 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 thoughts on Tom and Jerry, which is which I honestly. Uh, it, there, it's expected to have made twelve and a half million dollars this weekend at the box office, which would make it the, I think, the second biggest movie release behind Wonder Woman mm -hmm. um, since the pandemic. And it's, it's insane to think that it's Tom and Jerry, but I mean, it's a family movie. Uh, it's, it's disturbing that it's Tom and Jerry, though. Chloe Grace Moritz. I mean, I, I, I guess these are reasons why it's, why this is, why this is doing so well. But yeah, like, I mean, it's a family it movie, <laughs> and families have been cramped in their houses uh, if, if they're following the rules, which I think is like two families in the country. Uh, but they would be cramped in their house. They want to get out. I'm curious to see if – I was surprised by the money it made this weekend because, it, you know, when you consider how how small the theater attendance is right now, how many how few theaters are open as compared to normally, $12 million is a lot of money. Um, yeah. So it, it's either disturbing or a good sign. So – I was hoping it's because the vaccine rollout has started. A lot of people are already getting vaccinated. They're feeling more safe to go out. More likely, it's that people just don't care about the pandemic anymore. And it disturbs me. It's a family movie. If you want to put yourself in danger, cool. But bringing the whole family for COVID. But who am I to judge? Um, and that's not what I'm here to review anyway. I'm supposed to talk about Tom and Jerry. We we grew up in an awesome time, right? So we had our stuff. We had the He-Mans, the um, you know Thundercats, all those. But... And I don't think I'm alone on this. We had we, we watched Tom and Jerry, all the WB, the Hanna Barbera stuff from the sixties and seventies. Yep. Watch yep. it all the time. It was still on TV. I don't feel like kids now get that. They don't get all the generations. They just get the most recent stuff if they're not spending all their time on YouTube. Right. So I, I love that this exists. I love that they're bringing it back there. It, it broke my heart to find out that my six year old barely knows who Bugs Bunny is. Um, I, I failed as a father is what I'm trying to say. Um, cool. Chloe Grace Moretz, who I honestly thought we would be seeing a lot more of uh, at this stage in her career. Um, 
and this is definitely not what I was I was thinking for, but Grace Moretz um, leads the, the human element of the movie, um, and it is a fun family film. But it's a fun family film circa, or pre-Pixar, I should say. So the kids are going to love the hell out of it, and the parents won't be annoyed by it. It's not one of those, movie, those family movies that's made for the kids and the adults. Um, it's exactly what you'd expect Tom and Jerry to be. Uh, slapstick comedy, out and out. Uh, it, it, I always find myself wondering when they do these types of movies if the human element is needed. And I think it is because a two-hour cartoon of these two would probably not be interesting enough. But it also feels like the human element is there's nothing to it. I mean, it just serves the purpose of setting them up to. Aren't they like at a hotel where Chloe Moretz works? Yeah. So, so she's got this big event coming up and Jerry has gone on vacation. Um, and he goes to this hotel. So obviously they have a mouse running around and as a hotel owner does, they hire Tom, a cat, an animated cat to, uh, to get Jerry out. Um, and that's where, this, that's this the is, precipice of the whole movie. This is the worst run hotel in history then because. Yeah. Oh, no real hotel would, would hire a cat to catch a mouse. Well, right. And it, I don't know why they're surprised that Jerry's <laughs> there. Don't to explain it at all. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I don't know why they're surprised that Jerry's there. If you see in the trailer above me, uh, every few minutes it'll show Jerry going to his room. And if you don't want a mouse at your hotels, why build little mouse doors? Why do that? Silly. Um, I always assume that the mouse built the door themselves. Like the little mouse holes? Yeah. Yeah. That the mouse did that themselves, but my always thing was my thing was always just block it off. Yeah. Or just I mean I don't understand why this is so difficult. Why can't they do? It? I mean, whatever. Yeah, whatever. I, I mean the thing is Tom and Jerry, and, and like most cartoons, you know, it's very well known that some things are awesome in small doses. You know, Gilbert Godfrey can tell one funny joke, but you don't want to listen to him recite the Declaration of Independence, and that's what you, what you got here. I mean, these guys, they're. I know they're cons- kind of A-listers, but they're really perfect for those, like, an intermission type deal. Like, a, a three to five minute commercial where they chase each other, it's funny, and you move on. Um, that being said, you know, the movie is, I meant to look up the runtime, I forgot. It felt fast. It's an hour and 41 minutes, um, which is a little longer than it needed to be, but it doesn't feel long. Uh, and it gets the job done, and you won't be annoyed or bored, really. So, you right, put that on the movie poster, you won't be annoyed or bored. I haven't seen it, so I can't say anything. Uh, it's, I know it's got Michael Pena and like, Ken Jong and all sorts of people like that in there. Yeah. Uh, directed by Tim Story, who did both Fantastic Four movies and a whole bunch of other stuff. Mm-hmm. Really successful filmmaker. Um, okay, I mean, I, I mean, look, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't exactly sell me on it, so I mean, I, I'm, I'm probably still not going to go watch it. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, okay. your review is more positive than than any other that I've heard, so I will take that into account. Yeah, I mean, well, they, they, you know, the one line of it all is it's for kids exclusively, but right. parents won't be, you know, clawing out of their seats for they, it. I'd know. much rather they make an itchy and scratchy movie. That would be, I'm amazed they haven't done that, or at least like a half hour I special. I don't want any humans in it. I don't want no humans in it. I yeah. hate the human element. Unless it's Who, who Framed Roger Rabbit, I almost always hate the human element. So. Yeah, it, it usually isn't needed. I mean, it, it, they always put the humans in for the reason they do a lot of weird stuff, which is so you can identify or connect with the movie. But get, if we're going to see a movie about an animated, you know, cat and mouse, we're not really worried about connecting. Just make. I don't. Yeah, I don't understand. I don't, excuse me, yawning. I don't understand doing hybrids of these kinds of movies if the live action piece is pathetically underdeveloped or has no connection to the animated part. Well, right, like, but Roger but, Rabbit. It was yeah. integral. Right, right. They're, they're right, exactly. So I don't understand why make it that way. I, I'd be just as happy if it were fully animated and Chloe Moritz voiced a woman in the movie. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Know, that's, that's what they do 99% of the time to greater success, mm-hmm. which is why I don't understand why they keep trying these live action things. Animated movies are more successful. Just do them. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I, got, I mean, I could be very wrong on this, but I feel like it's got to be harder to do. Well, no, I guess they don't have to draw the background, so it's probably easier. But yeah, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. There's no reason to put the live action in unless it has a reason to be there. And this doesn't. So Michael, Michael Pena uh, also, I know you mentioned his name. I was watching Fantasy Island the other day because Angela, my wife, was, my was wife the, for those out there. Was the controller broken? And you couldn't turn the channel? No, she really wanted to watch it. I didn't absolutely hate it. But, um, you know, 
it always whenever he pops up, I'm always thinking, this guy just he he's like, you know, he he's like Nick Nick Cage almost. He just takes whatever comes his way. I mean, he's, he's much more talented, I think, um, as far as traditional acting Cage, but he's. I don't, I don't, I don't even think that's true. I don't think that's true. No. No, I think Nicholas Cage is a better actor than him. It's just yeah. Okay, let me. We got we got we got to give we got to we can't just take the last ten years and take and make that the entirety of Nicholas Cage's career. Nicholas you're Cage, right. I, Danny Trejo or Bruce Willis is what I meant. Um, you know, and, and I was just trying to find I was trying to find somebody that's in every single he's movie. Definitely but... better than he's definitely better than than Danny Trejo. He's I don't know I don't know if you can say he's better than Bruce Willis if I'm honest. But Bruce Willis has done a lot more than the shit he's done too. He's a lot like Nick Cage now, right, where, so, he had, where he had a good career before this, and now he's doing shit. That's interesting to me, though. So, so what's a good <laughs> dramatic performance of Bruce Willis? That <clears throat> becomes her. I mean, that was well, that's more comedic. Yeah, I mean, I have to think about it a little bit. I mean, I don't know, Color of Night is shit. Um, it's got good scenes though. <laughs> You're not going to get me to complain about Jane March and anything. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> I'll never forget that movie. I went on a date. I took a date to that movie. Oh, yeah. I, that was a bold move, friend. That is, that's either going to pay off sure, really I well had, for you I or... I had no idea what the movie was other than the fact that it had Bruce Willis in it. Oh. Um, <laughs> but they're a good job, Bruce, Bruce Willis roles. Obviously, we've got to think about like the Sixth Sense and, and stuff yeah. like that. Probably, are probably up there uh, among his best. Mm-hmm. Uh, Looper, you know stuff like that. He's done. He's done roles where he's been a- asked to actually act and not just be Bruce Willis. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, Michael. And look, this, this isn't shitting on Michael Pena. I like Michael Pena a lot. He's one of my. Oh, favorites. I love the guy. Yeah. Yeah, he's one of my favorites. I just don't know if I put him up there in a category with those guys yet. <laughs> he's got a long way to go. Yeah. Was, he's got a long, that's what I'm saying. He could already be there if he wasn't wasting his time on these on these shit movies in between. And I have no problem with doing a paycheck movie. Do your thing, make your money. But it's it's literally there's no there's not even like a theme to the movies he takes. He's in he goes from Fantasy Island to Tom and Jerry to Ant Man. I mean, it's just all over the map. It's crazy. But it's it's a, it's, a, it's a credit to what he's been able to accomplish that he can make movies like that, and they cast him because he's Michael Pena. Right. I mean. He's reached a certain level of, of notoriety, and maybe the Marvel stuff helped. I'm sure mm-hmm. he did. Um, but he's reached a level of notoriety where he could be cast and stuff like that. The reason he was why he was in Fancy Island is because he's Michael Pena. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, <laughs> they could have picked somebody who looked a lot more like Ricardo Montalban if they wanted to, but they yeah. went with Michael Pena because he's Michael Pena. And he's People know him, and he's good at, at certain things. So I'm, I'm going to peel back the curtain real quick, and just to, just because I think it's funny how how off the charts we go everywhere. Before yeah. we started the show, Travis and I agree. We're like, well, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the reviews, and uh, we're just getting right to the, the big <laughs> stuff. We've now spent 11 minutes on Tom and Jerry. Fair. So let's... <laughs> we're not. To be fair, we're not spending a lot of time on the review. We're talking about everything but the review. We're not fair enough. Tom and Jerry at all. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Well, because I don't have a better segue, what rhymes with Tom and Jerry? Cherry. Uh, Tom Holland's uh, dramatic uh, turn, PTSD involved, bank robbery, the Russo brothers, all kinds of stuff. And this is not the Tom Holland that, uh, you know, the nerdy little um, shy guy from Spider-Man. Totally different situation. Yeah. No, this is a big movie. People have been waiting a long time for this one. Um, Cherry is the first movie by the Russo brothers. Uh, who are, of course, they're the Marvel heavy hitters. I mean, they're away from Marvel now. They're away from the Avengers movies. This is their first directing gig since then. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it's it's obviously very different. It's it's based on uh, Nico Walker's book. It stars Tom Holland as a as a guy who calls himself Cherry, or he's called Cherry. Um, Ohio kid uh, joins the military after his girlfriend <laughs> his girlfriend flakes on him. She's like, yeah, I'm going to move to Montreal. Okay, well, I'm heartbroken. So I'm going to go join the military. Hey, I'm coming back. What the hell? I'm already enlisted. Uh, what kind of shit is that? Um, but anyway, so, <laughs> you imagine, he, uh, the only thing that made me mad about this movie was how how he wasn't pissed about that. Like, I would have been livid. Yeah, you basically just signed a possible death livid. warrant and at least a yeah. two-year contract. I would have run away. I would have been yeah. like, you got to be kidding me. But he, he, joins, he joins the military, uh, sees all sorts of horrors that he no one his age, he's like 21, 22 years old at this point, right. should ever have to see, comes home fucked up, PTSD, gets hooked on drugs, gets 
her hooked on drugs as well. Mm -hmm. um, and they just spiral, spiral down until they're committing, or he's committing bank robberies just to have enough money to get another hit. Uh, so it's a, it, this is a really, I'll say, well, I'll say, I'll say what I think the Russo's were trying to accomplish, first of all. I think this movie is probably getting hammered by critics probably worse than it deserves. Um, it's, I found it to be a, a pretty entertaining uh, crime epic that I think the Russo's were trying to do their version of a Scorsese crime movie. I think that's what they were, I think that's what they saw themselves making. Um, I don't think they, they accomplished that. Mm -hmm. um, anything on that level. This is like the third act of Goodfellas stretched into a two, half, two, and, a half, two and a half hour plus movie or whatever. Right. It's basically what it is. Um, and on that level, it's entertaining. Like they take big swings here up both, uh, you know, stylistically. It's broken down into, into, into chapters. Uh, they mess around with the aspect ratios as well, especially during the battlefield scenes. Mm -hmm. They're taking some big swings stylistically here. It's a big operatic film. It's kind of like they felt like they were making an Avengers movie of cri of drug and crime movies. It's like, that's what it seemed like they think they were doing. Mm -hmm. um, I think all of that is a little makes the movie it takes away from some of the grittiness of it that they were trying to go for. Like I, I, Scorsese knows how to dial it back at the appropriate time. And I don't think the Russos do. Um, so, it, like I said, this movie's meant to make. It's about a, a guy on heroin. It's about a, an Ohio kid. It's meant to be gritty and street level, and it's really not mm -hmm. because of some of the bells and whistles they try to add to the movie kind of takes away from it. But at the same time, I really like Tom Holland and Ciara Bravo in the movie. Mm -hmm. um, it's sneaky casting because they're both so young and fresh faced looking that you want to like take them in your arms and hug them and keep them away and protect them from the world and make and, and not want them to get all fucked up and then you see them spiraling down and you know they have so much potential at least she had potential i don't know if he necessarily did i think he was fucked up beforehand and probably if would you have sign always... up for the military because your girl broke up with you you're fucked no up you, have to be a, you, have, you have to be a certain level of broken to do that already yeah. um um, but you know, but watching them be become what they do is actually kind of tragic. And I've even at the end of the movie, which seems like a happy ending, I was still thinking, I still think they're going to be fucked up. Uh. <laughs> yeah, because of what it took to get there. I mean, when, when when you go through that, I mean, let's be honest, he was he was fucked up for life already because because of his time in the military and everything they go through afterwards. It's you're not you're not you know happy go lucky after that. He's pretty aimless before the military already. Mm -hmm. um, you know, especially with the people you hung around. Uh, he wouldn't seem like he was really going anywhere, even right. though he was in college. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it didn't seem like he was really going anywhere. He seemed like he was just some white kid who went to college because he was supposed to, but he wasn't going to do anything with whatever degree he would have gotten. Right. He wasn't going to do anything with it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you on, on almost every point. I, you know, it felt to me like the Russos, who they always, it was always impressive to me the way they made the jump from doing like episodes of Community, where the biggest action was like a paintball scene. To... Do you remember Welcome to Collinwood, that movie they did? Like, that was like their first movie. No, I've never seen it. It was like George Clooney, and it's a comedy, and so it's, it's a silly. The name brings a bell, but I, I don't, I've never yeah. seen it. Well, look, look it up sometime. It was like their first movie. It was, mm -hmm. it was Clooney and a bunch of other people. It's kind of a, I don't know, comedy of errors, a bunch of goofballs not unlike the people who like cherry hangs around in the beginning of the movie you know it's sort of right. like that but um but yeah it, they made that jump from that to community to all of a sudden doing big marvel movies yeah i mean it's and it was, it's crazy and so the it took me a while to put my finger on it but stylistically the, it, it's kind of all over it's not i don't want to say all over the place because it's not disjointed and messy in that way but there's too many styles going on at once and it really felt to me like you know, they said, okay, we made a big jump to Marvel. We hit home run, but we had that style. We don't really know what our style could be. And this seemed like almost their their experimental movie where they're going to try out a bunch of different styles and see what they like doing the best. Um, Tom Holland, you know, can obviously continues to impress. Um, every, every time he's on something, the guy's just, even as a bank-robbing heroin addict, uh, you know, he's, he's still got a certain charm. Um, Sierra Bravo, who I'd never seen before, um, I had to look her up afterwards. She's a Disney Channel kid, Disney Channel star. Um, Aren't they all now? 
Yeah, yeah, I think I think it's like a factory. They all come up and go through there. Yeah. Um, but she's what? she was. Are we talking about that since, since you just mentioned that? And I'm I'm, I'm veering us off into another area that has nothing. To do with it. <laughs> um, I was watching. <laughs> I was watching the reveal of the Spider-Man title. You know, mm-hmm. the little teaser that they attached to it, and Zendaya was in it. And I was like, How is this the same Zendaya from Malcolm and Marie? Yeah, I so I didn't even know she was she was a Disney Channel kid until like two weeks ago. When I told you about Shake It Up with her and Bella Thorne. Right. Yeah. But yeah, which which, by the way, Bella Thorne, uh, you subscribe to her on on Snapchat or anything, you know, she ain't, you know, her her only fans, all that kind of stuff. And look, these these, these Disney Channel girls, when they did, they, when they get out of there, man, they, they go wild. It's preacher's daughter syndrome, man. (laughs) (laughs) But not that Zendaya's really gone wild, it's just that she's doing mature stuff. But it's just, it's just so weird to see her how she shifts gears and she looks completely different. Like looking at the, the Spider-Man teaser, she looks like she's 15 or 16 or something. It's crazy. Yeah. I, well, that's, that was so shocking about Malcolm and Marie. Cause you know, I, it's a totally adult mature role and she looks it. Mm-hmm. And then this teaser, I was like, how is this the same person? Exactly. And you know, she, not only that, but she seems like a 15 year old and she seems kind of reserved and kind of different, but then you see her in Malcolm Marie and not only is she like, you know, sexy all of a sudden, but also she seems like a more powerful type person. Um, she, she's going to, she's going to keep nailing it, uh, going forward. I, I, yeah, I think I bring that up. I think what made me think bring that up is because I'm not sure Tom Holland has reached that point where he can play somebody where he, where he can convincingly play somebody a little bit older. No, he's still baby yeah. face, man. Because when he was older, when Cherry is older in this movie, mm-hmm. they slap on this terrible mustache that looks makes him look like a Tom Selleck. It reminded uh, me of the end of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part Two, like yeah, that, that exactly. horrible aging up. Exactly. It, it was like, oh, so, there's, so we're supposed to believe he's older now because they slapped on this awful mustache. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. it, looked, it looked like the kind of mustache he should have worn when he was trying to rob banks. Mm-hmm. And he's trying to hide his face. Like, right. that's the kind of mustache it was. And I was like, they could have done better than that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially since it's Tom Holland and the Russo brothers who worked with Marvel and were able to make Chris Evans look 80. You know, they could have figured something out. Hey, man, their production company ain't got Marvel money. I know. I know. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, a lot of people, a lot of critics at least seem to be disappointed in Cherry. I mean, I. I They're really hammering it pretty bad. They yeah. Pretty bad. I didn't. I I think that. it was a bad movie. I mean, it, it wasn't anything mind blowing, but I don't. I didn't think it was really supposed to be. I um, just I found it to be more entertaining than anything else. If I looked at it too deeply, I probably wouldn't think. I, in fact, I don't. I, in fact, I've said that already. I think there's plenty of things that they fail at. Yeah. But I found it entertaining anyway to watch. I mean, maybe it's maybe it's simply because I like watching, you know, the final act of these rise and fall movies, like mm-hmm. like the final stretch of Goodfellas is like my favorite part or one of my favorite parts. You know, yeah, or the yeah. final stretch of, of Boogie Nights, you know, where they're mm-hmm. going to see Todd Parker. You know, like, I, I, I like the, the fall aspect of the rise and fall. It's, no. it's, it's, it's <laughs> makes me so anxious. Yeah. I can't stand that part. <laughs> it's like every time I watch a horror movie that I've seen before, and yeah. there's always that moment where all the kids are having uh, having a great time, and they're going to the party, and everybody's happy, and you're like, okay, we'll just stop there. Let's just end the movie there, and everybody's happy. Good job. Yeah. I get so anxious with stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, Cherry, other than the fact that it's, you know, I wish it would have been a, a more granular story and not, you know, it didn't have so many moving pieces to it. It wasn't such a, you know, broad view. Um, you know, it was, it was perfectly fine to watch. Yeah. All right. So uh, our third and final movie that we want to talk about, we want to talk about the United States versus Billy Holiday. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's Lee Daniels. So since it's Lee Daniels, I knew going in that this was going to be about a black person suffering, mm-hmm. and that he was going to equate that to dramatic weight because that's what he always does. Uh, he he's, he's been that way since Precious, which Precious was a movie about nothing but a black person suffering, mm-hmm. and he got all sorts of acclaim for it. You can argue about whether or not he deserved that or not. Uh, actually, no, we can't. He didn't. Um, and he's pretty much been doing the same thing ever since. And now, and Bill, you know, I said Billy Holiday is, is basically the same thing. Now, the, the big thing about this movie is Andre Day, who I think is tremendous as Billy Holiday. I think she's really great here in her first real major role, the breakout performance, I think. Where would we have seen her before? Because she does not. I believe she's mostly stage. 
Oh, okay. Yep. Right. Um, but I don't know a lot about her other than that. Um, she's got an amazing voice. She mm-hmm. Um, but the movie is about Billie Holiday and how uh, the FBI targeted her for her singing of the song "Strange Fruit," which is the song that 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 is about um, watching uh, black people be lynched, and mm-hmm. the fruit, "Strange Fruit" is the bodies of black people being hung from trees and so forth and so forth. Uh, it's a really so powerful. Disturbing. Yeah, it's a really powerful song. It's inspired by a poem. You should read the poem too. Hmm. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's a really powerful song. And the FBI um, targeted her because they wanted her to stop singing it because of the the feelings it was dredging up in people. Uh, this is right on the cusp of the uh, beginnings of the civil rights. Can we movement. not have better things to do with the country's well, leading law enforcement agency? This is multiple movies in the last year exactly. that, have, that have tackled Cointel Pro, which is the the FBI's operation into busting up, um, you know, factions and major players in this in the civil rights movement. So mm-hmm. we just had Judas and the Black Messiah, which was about that. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems like every oh, week we're talking about some other reason that Jig or Hoover was a piece of shit. Right. And then <laughs> about a year ago, we had Seaberg with Kristen Stewart as a celebrity actress who who sided with the Black Panthers and they targeted at her and smeared her until she killed herself. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and in and, and almost all of these cases, they use black people against other black people too, which is what makes it worse. Right. Um, but then, in the case of Andre, in the case of Billie Holiday, they use her drug use um, and her her addiction to men uh, against her. And they smeared her. They got her locked up. They framed her. They did all sorts of things. They took away her license so she couldn't sing in public places anymore. She did it anyway. She needed yeah, a license she, to sing. Yeah, the leaning license to sing in certain places. Yeah, remember oh. the time we're in too. Oh yeah, uh, I guess that's true. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so they, they took away took away her ability to, to do her job and basically make a living, um, all because of this, all because of a song, and you know, and the movie's about her continuance to to sing it and the and the, the attempt to, to smear her. Uh, the problem is the movie doesn't really focus on why the song was powerful or why she felt like she needed to keep singing it. Mm-hmm. Instead, it it mostly shows Billie Holiday at her worst, almost right. for the entire movie. That is all it is. It's her and drugs, her and men, her betraying her friends, four men, four drugs. It's basically just misery after misery after misery piled on. And this is Lee Daniels. Lee, this is what Lee Daniels does. Almost all of his movies are the same way. And so I knew that was what I was going to get going in, and now he did not disappoint me in that. That's exactly what he gave me. Um, so the only thing I really have to say that about it that I think is really great is is Andre Day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, like like you said, Lee Daniels, um, you know, he's he's very specific in his filmmaking, but I, I think he should have stepped out of that for this. And, and and I'm agreeing with you in the fact that he focuses so much on her demons that it it's almost like he's making the case for the FBI. Like if if you focus on her message and what she meant to people a little bit more or, or why the FBI doing this was so bad as opposed to her being really bad and, and them just saying, well, we're going to tell you about it, tell people about it. Um, you know, it, it seemed, I'm not saying to clean her background. I'm not saying to it's more like, sanitize it, but yeah, I think it's it more, I think it's more like she brought it on herself sort of thing. Like, right. I don't think, I don't think he's necessarily saying the FBI was right. In fact, I think he's, he's clearly saying that they're not. But he's say, but he's also saying she kind of brought it on herself too. Yeah, my fr- my phrasing wasn't good there. That's that's yeah, and I what I mean. You... Is that is it? You know, she or she she was making it easy for them. I guess is yeah, it, yeah, by yeah, the way yeah. he frames it. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. get what you're trying to say. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's. I mean, you got it's a great story to tell because she did do something really brave. No, oh, yeah, really courageous. And when I was watching it, and I was writing about this in my review. Is that when I was watching the movie, the movie that kept coming through my head, besides the ones I already mentioned, was One Night in Miami. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking about Sam Cooke. And I was thinking about how Sam Cooke was the one who was sort of reluctant to uh, to join them in being really vocal and, and outward mm-hmm. about, about you know his politics. And eventually he came around to it. And I was like, it's because of people like Billie Holiday that allows all of them to do this. Mm-hmm. it's because of the strength she showed and I was like there's such a clear map to what she went through to what people to what they were going through 
and what they had to put up with and what they were afraid of. Mm-hmm. And I was like, it's such a huge missed opportunity with this movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a huge missed opportunity. And I was like, this is this is why I can't I can't support this movie as much as I want to because yeah, Lee Daniels is so short sighted. Yeah. yeah, I mean he is he's very good at 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 pulling emotions out of you. I, I will give him that for sure. Um, you know what? We've had such um, like a landmark year and a half, two years um, for you know African American history in cinema. I guess is a way to say it. Like you know, there's all these you know shows and movies that are that are telling you things that history books conveniently left out, and they're shining lights on on certain things. I would really love to see um, a a mo- like an epic chronicling, you know, Harriet Tubman, the first all black, the way to Obama or something first like that. Black person in the world until now. Exactly. Like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Like, like Harriet Tubman in, to to Obama, but in, in the way that uh, what was that movie <laughs> that the, Wachows- the Wachowskis did with Tom Hanks? <laughs> well, you want to do like a Black Cloud Atlas? Yeah, Black that Cloud called? Atlas. That, well, that's what I would call it too. I would call it Black Cloud Atlas. <laughs> <laughs> All I'm saying is that you know, the, you know, the the spirit of this country is being brave and standing up for, or what it should be, at least I should say, is being brave, standing up for the little guy, doing the I, right thing in I the face of negativity, pitch, and I it think exemplifies. You should pitch black cloud atlas, black, black cloud atlas. You should pitch it to somebody. <laughs> oh, well. You know any black writers around who can do it? You... Yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I don't want, I don't want that that gig, man. You, <laughs> you got somebody else. <laughs> Wait. Are you... Are you saying they wouldn't let a white guy write Black Cloud Outlist? I don't understand why. Actually, they probably would. That'd be a problem. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. All right, so let's <laughs> let's talk. Let's talk about something else. Uh, Billy Holiday. So we'll start over, all right, first of all, let's start with where you can find these movies. So oh, yeah. you can find Cherry right now on Apple TV Plus. Mm-hmm. Um, United States versus Billy Holiday is on Hulu mm-hmm. uh, right now. And um, Tom, Tom and Jerry. Jerry is in theaters and on HBO Max. On HBO Max. So mm-hmm. everything is on a streaming service somewhere. Yep. So enjoy. <laughs> what a world we're living in. <laughs> yeah. And, oh. and you know what? another part of the news this week was, was Paramount. I mean, they're, mm-hmm. they're uh, shortening their theatrical release window for Mission Impossible 7 and A Quiet Place 2. They're shortening the theatrical window to 45 days. Yeah. Company. Before they moved to Paramount Plus, which is like, I mean, I don't look. I know we've tied these had these conversations before, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but things are never going to go back to the way they were. I'm sorry. I know we thought that maybe in the beginning we thought maybe they'd probably just go back, um, but we also both, I think you and I both knew that if these things were in place for too long and they started leaning more on streaming. Mm-hmm. They're never going to revert back to the way they were. We're at that point now where I don't think they ever go back to the way things were. Yeah, it's adapt or die for theaters. I mean, you, you got to bring something more to the table than overpriced popcorn, sticky floors, and dirty seats. Um, you know, you got to do something different. Now, it, to be fair, before COVID, we were almost here anyway. Because, I mean, theatrical release windows used to be three to six months minimum before you'd see it in a video store or anything like that. And since the advent of video on demand, that window's been been smaller and smaller tour and there were there were plenty of smaller movies lower level movies that would have hit bod 45 to 60 days after they went th- after they opened in theaters um but this is you know they're, they're doing it for for their tent poles now so and it plus, is it, at least they didn't go almost, all in and plus those movies are almost hardly in theaters anyway yeah fair enough <laughs> like they would say <laughs> theaters but like are they really though like could you really just go to a movie and see it no you probably couldn't uh, <laughs> I'll never forget when Barbershop came out 15 weeks after mm-hmm. it was in theaters and there was this big hoo-ha about it because of how fast that was and and now look at us now we're at like 45 days and the movie's coming out or just straight theaters and streaming you know it's just they're going to be the same man it's just not um, I, I hear legit like sadness in your voice from that I mean it is sad in a way I mean yeah Look, theater's not going anywhere. I think we're going to see probably a reduction in the number of theaters, mm-hmm. but theaters are going to stay. And you're always going to you're always going to have filmmakers who will insist on theatrical. Um, yeah. And but to be fair, studio doesn't have to do it, and not every th- and not every director could demand it. So mm-hmm. <laughs> it has the clout to demand it. Uh, yeah. so it might not matter, but 
I mean, I don't think it's it's necessarily a bad thing. You know, it if the other I feel like I'm, I'm keep bringing up the spirit of this country in the show, but you know, the the thing is innovation, right? You, you, I mean, theaters have been stagnating for, with the exception of higher resolution screens, and you know, the 40x that there's one in every state, and some little things like that. They, they've been the same business model for 60 years. So they had a good run that way. It's time now that they figure out somebody's got to innovate. Somebody's got to think about the thing that will get people in there and do it. And if if they find that, then they'll be fine. If they don't, then they don't deserve it anyway. That's what I have to say. <laughs> see what happens. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it does right. suck. it's just the same as, you know, we'll never be able to walk through a video store looking at random covers again. Um, you know, but there's good and bad to everything, I suppose. Yeah. Um, a lot of bad in WandaVision this week. Uh, do you want to start with that? Or do you want to start with Spider Man? We start with Spider Man. Yeah. So Spider Man title, we can finally stop calling it Spider Man Three. Thank mm-hmm. God, I was getting sick of doing that in every mm-hmm. post. Um, the movie finally has a title. It is called Spider Man No Way Home as the official title for the next Spider Man movie. Um, that title, I think it has a multiple meanings. Mm-hmm. Um, some news that came out shortly after that is that um, this is the end of Tom Holland's Marvel contract. Um, right, but he he's expressed that he wants to keep going. It's not like he, he said that they want me back. He'll come back in a heartbeat. So yeah, of course he they want him back, but it is still the end of his contract, and yeah, and it 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 could mean him going over to Sony full time or anything else. I mean, who knows what it could mean. But, oh, fuck, I forgot about that. I mean, that's Sony. Yeah, yeah, it was Sony. It was Sony, yeah. Um, but remember, they had that whole thing about a year ago when it looked like he wasn't going to be able to come back. It was like mm-hmm. it, was, it was like right before Far From Home came out or whatever it was, maybe, um, that they had that little, that contract sp- dispute between Marvel and Sony, this whole big thing. Oh, my God, Tom Holland's done and with Marvel. Yeah, everybody lost their minds for a week, and then they worked yeah. out. Yeah, and it got worked out largely because of Holland. Uh, reaching out to both both sides um but th- when that whole deal was done uh he was supposed to have two more movies left and s- one was spider-man 3 and another one was supposed to be some big marvel avengers mm-hmm. sized thing but who knows that might not be the case but but he said himself his deal is done right now so but no way home the title suggests some things so what we know is this Wait, phase but real quick before we get into that I just had a question, and maybe you have insight on. Where does the whole inclusion of the word home in all the Spider-Man titles come from? Is there any reason for that, or did it, is it just random and they decided to stick? I with think it? it's. I think it's just something that became a theme. I don't think it was. I don't think they started out that way. I think it's just something that became a theme. Mm. Um, but it makes sense, and it makes it actually makes sense now too. Yeah. yeah. Um, because this movie, as we know, by pretty much all of Phase Four, and including WandaVision, the multiverse is going to play a big role in all of this. And I will not be surprised. Here's my theory. Here's my theory. Mm-hmm. I think Tom Holland, Peter Parker gets trapped out in the multiverse in another, another universe ends up over in the Sony universe. We know that, or at least we think, well, we know Sony characters are going to be in this movie. Jamie Foxx is Electro. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, the um, Sony Andrew Andrew Garfield. Yeah, Alfred, yeah I'm Alfred tracking. Well, so according to Holland, neither Maguire or Garfield is in the movie. Uh, but Alfred Molina is in the movie as well. So characters from the Sony verse are in this movie too. Mm-hmm. I think Tom Holland's Peter Parker gets stuck out in, in the in another universe, possibly the Sony universe. Kind of like a reverse and into they, the Spider Verse. And I think. Right, and I think we get another Spider-Man, and I think it's going to be Miles Morales. So then, you think he'll be done? I think he'll be in the he'll be in the MCU until whenever time Tom Holland is brought back. Which I think Tom Holland's Peter Parker comes back in the next Avengers sized movie. Oh, that'll be a big reveal if they do that. I mean, yeah, you know, that actually makes more sense uh, than anything else I was thinking because. There was a huge question about the reveal at the end of of, um, Far From Home. You know, when in the mid credit scene, when J. Jonah Jameson reveals who he is to everybody, you know, how's he going to deal with How's he going to be your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man when everybody knows who he is? You know, and the answer is 
he goes to a different universe. <laughs> you know, it makes sense. Yeah. I, I think that's what's going to end up happening. But then again, I don't know. It's all speculation. It's all a guess on my part. So God, I feel like shit is about to get so weird. And if this was anybody but Marvel who have given me no reason to doubt them, I, I would think there's no way anybody can accomplish this in a way that makes sense and is fun and is everything you want it to be without totally destroying the feeling of the MCU. Yeah. It's, it's going to be a big job. And playing a part in all this will be, of course, WandaVision. Mm-hmm. Uh, WandaVision, which uh, had its, I believe it's eighth episode. Yep. Uh, we got one more left. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about what happens after this one, in this one? Because this is the one that follows uh, the big re- Agatha reveal with the greatest the greatest ending, with the greatest jingle. Um, <laughs> Agatha all along. Love it. I love it. Uh, they're doing they're doing Agatha all along merchandise based off that too now, by the way. Are they? Yes, they are. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Um, so this, this, this episode was basically the big exposition dump. Yep. This was the expedition dump episode where everything, <laughs> everything that we needed to know kind of comes out. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about what happens in it? Tell people a little bit what happens in it without going too deep into it for those who haven't seen it. Well, yeah. I was going to let you, uh, cover it cause I, I'm not sure where my lines will be. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how much people want to get into it anyway. I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it at this point in the series. Yeah, um, yeah. Like I said, this is basically the expedition dump, and what we find out, uh, what we have is basically Agatha uh, revealing herself to be an all-powerful witch. We see her, uh, sort of, not her origin, but what happens to her way back in the past, Mm -hmm. uh, which, back in the Salem times, uh, she apparently has this powerful purple energy that she uses as she kills her own mother and all these other witches in her coven, and Mm -hmm. she gets all this power, immense power. And what we find out really is that she's not, she, it's not as if she created this reality that Wanda's in. Wanda still did all this, mm-hmm. but Agatha has been in there kind of manipulating the people inside of it. She took, an, she took advantage of a, of a opp- opportunity that she saw, basically. Right. So it seems like she was going to come after Wanda anyway. Mm-hmm. And this was, and she got stuck up in, up in this situation with everybody else. She's using it to her advantage. Um, but basically, she walks Wanda through her entire past, going all the way back to when she was a child and when they had she and her and Pietro were uh, trapped by the rubble from that Stark weapon. A mm-hmm. um, little bit of retcon there, too, by the way. There's a little bit of retconning going on in this of Wanda's past. Uh, which, you know, I don't think it's anything major, but there's a little bit. Yeah. I, you know, I never mind that. You know, I know some people lose their shit on continuity, but, you know, if, if, as long as it's not something major, then it's... Marvel, Marvel retconned away so much shit when they were in, when I used to read the comics all the time religiously. That's the thing. Comic books are literally have no continuity. <laughs> you know. I can't stand retconning. I hate it and everything. I hate it in this too, but it's not... It's not big enough that it changes any aspect of her character. Right. Uh, at least I don't think so. Um, I'm trying to think what the big reveals here were for Wanda. Um, what were the biggest reveals for her? Basically, she was trained using the Mind Stone. Mm-hmm. Or was that the Mind Stone? Yeah. That was yeah. the Mind Stone. Yeah, that's when they were talking about, you know... I- when they said, uh, when she was saying regarding vision, you know, I could, I could feel, you know, cause every time she goes near him in that stone, that's their connection because she got her powers from the mines, from the, uh, from an infinity stone. So she can feel yeah. through the mind stone. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, big reveals. Um, she didn't exactly steal vision. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a reason why vision can't leave. Let's basically just say, because like I said, I don't want to spoil anything. Uh, we, we, there's a reason why vision can't leave the reality of Westview Mm -hmm. and go back out into the real world. There's a reason why you can't do that. Um, But then there's a post-credit sequence with him too, which is, I thought was really awesome because we got to see the white, the white version of of Vision. so freaking creepy, man. The white vision of of Vision, the white version of Vision in the comics, he basically has no emotions. Mm -hmm. He's a robot. Right. He basically has no emotions. So I'm thinking this is going to end very tragically for Wanda. Like she's not going to get him back. <laughs> she's not going to get the man she loves back. And you know, I, the reason that sucks, and the reason this episode was so depressing, is it, it is. I mean, we let's be honest. We all know that this wasn't going to end with them being happily ever after. 
But, you know, their relationship, as weird as it is, because he's not even human and she's a witch, but their small moments in Infinity War and Endgame, well, I guess not Endgame. So Infinity War, what other movies? What was the one before? Was it? Uh, was it Civil War? That they were with? Whatever, you know, their, their relationship as it built through the series was, was very sweet. And Civil War and the two Infinity movies are the ones that we've seen the most of their relationship. Yeah, but and that wasn't much. They had a really great scene between them two where they first start to really mm. uh, feel something for each other. Um, right. She was Basically, she was raised on TV sitcoms. I think, this, I, think, I think we had all kind of figured out where the sitcom thing came from. She was yeah. raised on TV sitcoms. Um, when she was trapped in a rubble, she was still watching them. Like they're mm. still playing on the TV. Somehow the TV was still active. Yeah. She's still watching them. <laughs> yeah, it was her support system. And so when right. she needed it most, that's why the sitcoms are there because it's her support system. It's her go-to yeah. for that. It's also how she, she views uh, happiness and her mm-hmm. view of America is through TV sitcoms. So. Right. Uh, but there's a really great moment that they share, her and Vision, that I think is probably the best moment that they've ever had, that mm-hmm. they've ever shown of them in their relationship. Like, yeah. there haven't been many. There haven't been many where we've seen, like, well, why do they like each other? Right? Yeah, like, I... we, we've, we've never had that moment where we're like, why are they together? Like, they were just kind of together at one point. Like, it was just sort of there. Yeah, but their their relationship was always so sweet that I you know I didn't even find myself asking that question. As ridiculous as that the fact that they're in a relationship is, um, you know, you know whether he's making her a dish from from her from Sokovia, or um, you know the, the chemistry those two have, and in the sitcom scenes, especially in the early episodes, which I know some people didn't like because it was ninety nine percent sitcom, one percent story, uh, you know, continuing story. Uh, it, it, it was just they really work well together and we know that there's not going to be happy ever after. Right, so here's, here's my question to you. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I have, I have a theory. What do you think this last episode is going to be? Cause we're supposed to still have one major cameo left. I mean, it's gotta be Dr. Strange. No, it's not him. It's not him. We already know it's not him because it's somebody, uh, it's somebody that, um, I'll bet he's never worked with before. It's not oh, yeah. him. He said, um, he said expressly that it's not Benedict Cumberbatch. So I think so. There's I think there's clearly somebody that Agatha is working with or working for. Well, I mean, Mephisto is what everybody's been saying, but I have two ideas. All right, hit me. The first, I think she's working with Baron Mordo. Okay. Because we know that WandaVision leads directly into multi. Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Mm-hmm. Um, we're talking about magical powers, magical abilities, chaos magic. I guess that's another big reveal for her is that the, the words chaos magic are actually used in this for the first time. Um, and so is the word Scarlet Witch. And it pairs those two things, those two things go together. And there's, she's, there's apparently something to the Scarlet Witch. Mm-hmm. Like there's something to it uh, that is the, that antagonizes um, Agatha Harkness. Uh, it, it, it appears that they are polar opposites of some kind. Um, so I think Baron Mordo is who Agatha Harkness is working with, and that we'll see Chiwetel Ejiofor in the next episode. Okay, so um, it's already been confirmed that he's in the next Strange. He's going to continue being the villain. So, so that's my guess. That's one. Mm-hmm. My other guess is that that guy from Sword, the the main guy. The one who's yeah, the, uh, started leader. out cool and slowly become a dick, and he's kind of obsessed with Vision. Did you think he started out cool? I, I'm not alone on this thing because I I thought he was. I got the impression he was going to be a good guy at first, but right. Angela's like, no, I, he was creeping me out from the start. So I, I'm glad I'm not alone on that. All right. So I my guess is that he's secretly Ultron. No. Why? Really? You think? Why? Because I didn't think of it until now. Ultron, <laughs> Ultron can can change his form to look like a human. He's done it in the comics. Uh, easy way for him to evolve at this point too, in order to be able to do that. Just like the same way Vision can. Um, it would explain his interest in Wanda because up to the... it would explain his interest in Vision more than anything else. Oh, oh yeah, 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 him too. So, yeah, uh, I think those are my two guesses for the next episode. Is that one Baird Mordo's involved and two dude is 
as Ultron in disguise. I mean, that's better than anything I got. Uh, I mean, it, it, Paul Bettany's quote is what's thrown me off the most. I mean, if I didn't have that, I'd, I'd be rattling off cameos left and right. But um, I really don't. I, it's Jean Grey. It's got to be Jean Grey, and that's going to—they're going to introduce the X Men because I've always wanted to see a Scarlet Witch Jean Grey fight. There's an episode in this scene where they're showing Wanda, and she kind of bursts of power, mm-hmm. red power. But there's also like yellow in there, and I know it's probably just power from the Mind Stone because that's yellow. Mm-hmm. But um, but it looked a lot like the Phoenix Force for a second. I was like, I was like, no. I was like, okay, no, okay, no, it's not, it's not that. <laughs> yeah. And this, okay. I mean, oh, honestly, and basically, also this, this also basically confirms that 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 guy is not Quicksilver. He's not going to be Quicksilver. He's just some dude. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he is not real Pietro. Which I don't know if that if if I I don't know if I'm disappointed in that or not. Part of me just doesn't care, but the other part of me thought it would have been a really cool way to start crossing over if if in an explanation for the multiverse. I, I really thought it was him from the mcu and he was just disoriented that's why he didn't remember the past because they didn't share the same past but he did know it was his sister um you know because it's from a different universe so i I thought that would be a really cool way to put it in but it is i'm I'm somewhat disappointed but i it's not really that big of a deal but i I mean visually this this episode my only concern for the next episode and i doubt it but i'm I'm afraid they're gonna be a game of thrones on us because so much was given in this episode that we've been waiting for. I know people complained a lot about the first couple episodes not moving the story forward. We had to wait a long time for what we got. The mystery stayed there for a good long while. Yeah. And it paid off this week. And I just hope they continue the me- momentum to next week because that's, that's you know. I, I also wonder, looking at the MCU as a whole, after this, how how is Falcon and the Winter Soldier going to feel? It feels like we've got two different universes now. I mean, doesn't it already kind of feel that way? I mean, yeah. you look at like, like Captain America and the what the, the what not the first Avenger what was the one that came after that, uh, the uh, Winter Soldier, Winter Soldier, yeah. Winter Soldier, which feels completely different than any other movie in the Marvel Universe. Yeah, I mean, you think about it, you're like, how does that movie exist in the same universe as Guardians of the Galaxy or Ant Man? Like, how do these things exist in the same universe? Yeah, they're but already, they, they, they still feel like, like they do for some reason. That's the that's the magic of Marvel. Is if they can yeah, do something yeah, completely yeah. different and make it feel the same. Totally. Yeah. I think the biggest thing I'm surprised I'm surprised we haven't had like the deluge of people like, well, why aren't the Avengers coming to coming into Westview to try and stop it? Like, I'm surprised we haven't had like those dumb questions. I yet. hate when that stuff and comes up. I'm glad they haven't even addressed it. Like, I'm glad it hasn't yeah. been brought up in the series. Like, well, where's Falcon? Why isn't he here to try and stop this? Or Mm-hmm. Where's where are these people? Where are the Avengers at? Why aren't they here to stop this? I'm glad nobody's even brought it up. Yeah, I, don't I want, mean, I, don't I think can't about tell that. you how many times I've heard somebody say over the last ten years since Marvel, "Well, wait a second, if the Avengers are there, you know why? You know, if such and such was going to destroy the world. Is that not the same, dude? Some things you just got to say it's a movie, <laughs> and yep. it doesn't make sense to the story. Yep, I agree. Um, all right, so. The other big news this week uh, was Superman news. I know you spent a lot of time talking about. We're at about 54 minutes, which is a little less time than I wanted to talk about it. But I have some questions. You okay. go ahead. So the big news of the week, the biggest news of the week, uh, Warner Brothers is moving forward on a new Superman movie written by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Ta-Nehisi Coates, uh, probably the preeminent black writer and thinker, uh, journalist, author, just essayist in the country right now. Uh, he's just a tremendous writer. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's also did, written stuff for Marvel. He wrote Black Panther, uh, along with Christopher Priest. He, uh, they're, they're basically the two guys who've given us the modern version of Black Panther that we know. Uh, he's written Captain America as well. So the guy has has comic book roots. Uh, but now he's going to be tackling probably the most iconic American hero of all time, mm-hmm. Superman. And apparently it, they, Warner Brothers is seeing this as a black story. A black Superman story. Um, so this, effectively, as far as we can tell, it, it sounds like it's going to be a complete reboot. Effectively, writes off Zack Snyder and Henry Cavill as Superman. That's what it seems like. It seems like they're done, and they're doing something else. Now, well, in, a, in a world now, we have the Joker, 
you know. Right. This is exactly what I was saying. On the because there's no, there's been no clarification on any of this mm-hmm. so speculation. But on the other hand, it could be like an, another Elseworlds type story, just like Joker was. Mm-hmm. So it could be that, and maybe Cavill and you know is still around as Superman. We really just don't know yet. That's as far as we know. Um, but we also know that a few years ago, Michael B. Jordan had pitched a black Superman story to Warner Brothers, and they were considering it for a while, and it kind of fell through. I think a lot of people are expecting that they're going to revisit that now um, and have Michael B. Jordan in the role. And I think that's probably what will happen. But we're going to see. But this is it's huge, man. It's big. Is there any indication in the stories whether it's going to be Calvin Ellis or they're going to change Clark Kent? Or We don't know. We, have, we, don't, we don't know. <laughs> so... You don't know enough about anything yet, except that Ray Fisher hates it. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Ray, that was Fisher good. Thinks, the Ray Fisher thinks it's a plot to uh, <laughs> to to uh, to, to uh, uh, distract from his allegations against Walter. Wow. Obama. D- I really wish he was talking tough. about the height of everything doesn't revolve around you, dude. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, no. Um, and, I, and I'm somebody who started out on Ray Fisher's side, and I just wanted to shut up. Because yeah, now I think everybody did, but he's shooting on things. Because look, we know Josh Whedon's a bad guy. Yeah. We know, we know, and trust me, Josh Whedon's career is effectively over at this moment right now. Right. With all the allegations that come out against him, Ray Fisher is one, mm-hmm. and he needs to shut up. I mean, <laughs> he's never I mean, going to work with Warner Brothers. It seems like he expected, like he won, but it seems like he expected a different result. It's like he expected a ticker tape parade and a cyborg movie. Right. He's going to get neither. Because he's because he's done nothing but shit on Warner Brothers, so why should they work with him? That's why they cut his ass from the Flash movie. Right. But now he's shitting on stuff that has nothing to do with him, and is actually a really good idea mm-hmm. and a really good, a really, a, I think an important thing, an important step for them to take is to making this kind of movie. And he's going to shit on it and say, "Oh, it's just a distraction. It's just they're covering up for their racist, their racist attacks on me." And it's like, I mean, just talk talk about a way to throw cold water on something that seems pretty cool. Yeah, well, I mean, I, what I want, what I want to get your take on is now. Admittedly, I, I don't know. I've never read any of the Calvin Ellis books, so Calvin Ellis, for anybody that doesn't know, was the was an African American version of super. Well, I guess he was African Kryptonian version. Of, so I don't know how that works. He, he was he was a black Superman. Um, and the first thing I think about with this is okay, think about who Superman is as a, as a person because obviously trolls are gonna hate it, whatever. Um, but Superman is defined by his upbringing right by by his his um the, the environment around him when he grew up everything about him is defined yeah. by that kansas farmhouse and yeah. superman's upbringing clark kent's upbringing is not something that i'd imagine a young black kid growing up in america can replicate yeah. so the end result's gonna be much different so how does how yeah. does black superman differ from white superman and like what what do you think I mean, this is one who's going to have to, it's going to be a Superman who's grown up probably having faced racism, prejudice his entire life mm-hmm. for something other than being a superhero. Right. Having superpowers. Like Clark Kent felt ostracized because he was different than everybody else. Like literally he's an alien with superpowers. Mm-hmm. He felt different than everybody else. This is probably going to be a person, I'm guessing, I don't know what ta Coates' plan is, but I'm mm-hmm. guessing this is going to be somebody who maybe didn't have those powers in the beginning, or maybe he did, but even so, he was ostracized for, for something else entirely, for being black. I'm imagining that race will play a very integral part of his upbringing. I don't know what that's going to lead to as him as an adult superhero, though. And that's why I'm fascinated. That's yeah. why I'm fascinated. I mean, because it really... It's really, really uh, insightful um, stuff here. That's I'm, I'm really yeah. interested in what he does. I mean, there's... Because there, I'm just... Because I, I, I was thinking the whole thing through... That it, it fascinates me how because I never realized how dependent Superman, the Superman we know, is on his upbringing and his race and everything like that. It's where so, all of his, it's where all of his values are formed. Like yeah. he didn't, have, he didn't grow up on Krypton, so he didn't have, he didn't grow up with their values. He grew up with Kansas values, with right. the idea of what, with the idea of those Midwestern home red blooded American male type deal right. stuff. Right. I mean, we can argue about whether or not those things actually hold up or not. I would say the answer is absolutely not. Mm-hmm. But at least back then, at that point, that was what the ideal was considered. There's yeah. a different ideal for what... There's a different I, American ideal nowadays, I think. Right. And I, if, if Coates is going to take it from that direction, this would be very, very interesting. I mean, the thing that 
that I really hope they play up because it's it's the thing about Superman has always been that he is somebody that could force the world to kneel, but instead he chooses to help. And he's a a white middle class suburban dude coming up, so the world's always worked in his favor. A lot easier to do that and help people when you don't need to change the world just to live in it. Now imagine that person was African American and growing up in a world where people were forcing, you know, dealing with all the stuff that minorities have to deal with, and you literally have the power to enforce that change. You're indestructible. You're going to make him an angry black Superman? No, I'm not. That's what I'm saying. it, It makes him an even more honorable Superman because he's got all that more reason to be angry. I think what you're going to see is won't. maybe a Superman who is right, who is not angry, or at least he may be angry, but he doesn't he doesn't lash out. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I'm not saying he's going to be angry Superman. I said he has more reason to be angry, so it'll but be more. He's going, to face, he's going to face criticism from blacks who think that he should. It's going right. to be yeah. it's going to be a lot like the dynamic between T'Challa and Killmonger. Mm-hmm. I think there's going to be people who think that he should be he should be like Killmonger and use his powers. To to bend the world to his to his to his whim, yeah. Like, I think there's going to be people that are like that, and there's going to be others who say no. He should use his gifts for good, and to he's going to have to defend himself him. every time the news shows another, um, you know, black guy getting shot by the police or something. He's going to have to defend the reason he doesn't do that every single time. Right, and Coates, who is you know very familiar with that that, that dynamic from writing those Black Panther stories. Mm-hmm. I think he's going to bring a lot of that to Superman. I, I, I'm I can't tell you how excited I am to see what he does. That's that's all I know. So who do you, who 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 plays the role? I mean, we got uh, the the image I put up is uh, a composite of Michael B. Jordan, but I think Michael B. Jordan is the guy who plays it. I think he has he has the look. He has, obviously, he has the physicality, mm-hmm. and I think they're going to want a Superman who is. I hate to use this word, but it's the word I'm going to use. Approachable. Um, and Michael B. And Michael B. Jordan is. I mean, everybody mm-hmm. likes him. Uh, if, if they, if you're looking for somebody for Superman, if you're looking for Superman, no matter what, you want somebody who is approachable and likable. Everybody, er, everybody likes him. You, you want the person who looks like that, it, whether he's white or black. Right. Um, and Michael B. Jordan is fits that mold. If I were picking my Superman, I'd pick Aldous Hodge to be Superman in a heartbeat. But. The problem is Aldous Hodge is playing Hawkman over on Black Adam right now, so they can't really do that. Yeah. I, I, I looked at and my pick immediately would be I'd be like call Aldous Hodge, make him Superman right now. I mean, <laughs> so I'm gonna pull up his his picture because the thing is, <laughs> see, because Aldous Hodge and this is gonna sound the wrong way. It doesn't matter that he's black, be Chinese or white. He's scary looking. Like when he when he gets an intense look in his eyes, he looks like somebody that will fuck you up. But yeah, I kind of like that. What? So you you're the one who wants angry Superman? <laughs> no, 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 I like that he can. But shit, have you seen Superman? Superman looks it was more terrifying than almost anybody. Henry Cavill when he's angry? Are you kidding me? That's no true. Way. Yeah, no way, man. I mean, I, guess I, I was just being racist. Superman, look, <laughs> for all for all the things that are good on Superman, Superman when he's angry is terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> so, I mean, I'm he's okay a god. Because Aldous Hodge has played plenty of roles where he's just a nice guy in fact most of his roles he's just a nice guy right um but he's also jacked he's like physical i was, I was just about to say that I'm, I'm cycling through images google images and i knew he was a, a tall broad shoulders yeah. this dude yeah. is built <laughs> yeah, man so i mean yeah. he, i would love to see him as superman <laughs> because i know and i know when he needs to get angry he can do it and he'll he will be scary but because they're gonna he, go more will smith you're thinking they're gonna go more yeah, Will Smith might be like just a bit too far into the into the nice guy category, whereas into Michael the B. don't scare white people category. Michael B. Jordan, Michael B. Jordan is like just in the perfect wheelhouse. It still blows my mind <laughs> that we can say Michael B. Jordan has the physicality to play Superman because my head always, whenever I hear his name, it goes right back to the Wire when he was that scrawny little kid, um, and he was in a couple other things I saw him then, and I still remember the first time I saw Creed, I was like. This dude just like tripled in size. Yeah. In any event, it's it's gonna be huge. Um, and I hope I, I number one, I hope it happens. I, I'm just crazy. It's probably one of the most interesting comic book stories. And of all the comic book characters 
you could race switch. But and let's all not forget, it's not a race switch because Superman's an alien. Um, but <laughs> all the characters you could do that with. Which the, is going to be, you know, that's what people are going to say, and that's going to be the comeback. It's like, he's, he's, he's a Kryptonian. Yeah. He's, he's, <laughs> well, Heim, Heimdall is, is a fictional character, you know, is, is, is a mythological character. It didn't seem to bother them, but, um, you know. Oh, it, yes, it did. Oh, yes, it did. No, no, I mean, it didn't bother them that he was mythological. They still got pissed about it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They definitely were mad that he was played by Idris Elba. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I know, because. They're definitely mad. I'm going to name drop here, because, um. I got I got called I got White Boy called by uh, by Idris Elba uh, when I was talking to him for uh, what was the movie um, Takers uh, right. and it came up about Heimdall uh, and we're we're talking about that and you know he's obviously very frustrated with the fact that people are and he says you know every you know you go anywhere you know you're you're Tom Cruise we we have to stand out that much more to get recognized and then you get something big and you get knocked down for it. Uh, and I don't know if you know this, but it just it just was like six three and very big. Yeah, I, I, it was scary. Um, but of all the characters to do to to wrap it up, of all the characters to do, Superman's dependency on his upbringing, his environment, his family, and the fact that that whole dynamic can change. I'm gonna go. I need to go back and read the Calvin Ellis books to see if if it, this question's already been answered. But I'm like terribly interested to see how they do that. And we don't know that he's doing that storyline in particular. I think he's doing something new, but but we'll see. Mm-hmm. We just don't know. We really don't know any much of anything about what he's going to do. So, but 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 obviously, his upbringing is going to be as much of a factor for this Superman as it was for the one that we already know. Yeah, like there's just. I mean, do, do they go? Do they keep him as a farm boy? Do they move him to a city, the suburbs? I mean, there's just a lot of I stuff. Doubt, I doubt they go with the farm boy thing. I think they go. Not, there aren't that many farm boys growing up, and <laughs> I mean, it's not which it's, it's not like what it is back then, where people were growing up on the farm and all shucks, and you know, going to play football in school. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Come, yeah. come back and 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 help uh and help sow sow seeds in the field. It's <laughs> not it's not there's not that much of that going on in the world right now. So I think he'll do something a little bit more contemporary. True enough. <laughs> all right. Um, so that's the show. That's that, it, man. That's the um, show for this week. What do we got yeah, next cool. week? We usually don't do a recap anymore, but um, yeah, I don't know what's next week. Uh, oh, next we week, got coming to America too. Is that coming next to, week? Coming to America, uh, Raya: The Last Dragon, which is Disney's latest, mm-hmm. and um, there's something else too. I can't think of what it is. Who knows? Those are two big ones right there. I'm well, really no matter what it is, we'll be covering it here next week. Uh, and until next week, check in every single day at our site www.punchdrunkcritics.com uh, on Twitter the site is at PDC Movies Travis is at Punchy Critic and I am at Punch Drunk John uh, on Twitch follow Travis if you're not doing that already at Cinematic underscore Enforcer uh, if you have any tips or questions and just to put this out before we post it on the site we are currently on the lookout for writers if, if you are passionate about movies if you have a voice that you want to have heard uh, writing for the Punch Drunk Critics can get you to, out to an audience of over 150,000 unique people a month uh, that we get to our site. Um, all the specifics of employment or whatever you want to call it can be worked out there. But if you have interest in writing, info at punchdrunkcritics.com. Send us an email there, uh, and we'd love to hear from you. Man, the Golden uh, Globes are tonight, aren't they? I never had any interest in the Golden Globes. I don't mean I, I mean, I used to love them, but now I don't care. I'm I'm just thinking about it because I know I'll have to post whoever wins tonight. So I'm just like, and if you send us an email at info at punchdrunkcritics dot com, you can do that for Travis because we'll let you write that. Dude, somebody do that. <laughs> I don't want to do this stuff anymore. He needs a break, folks. All right, guys. Until next week, I'm John. I'm Travis, and we are out of here.